So I, I found the lump myself, uh, I'd say last winter, and I didn't um, initially think that it was anything to be concerned about, but I kept feeling it, and I couldn't get it out of my head, so I made the call. You know, when someone looks you in the eye and says, we believe uh, you have breast cancer, you immediately in your mind uh, start planning for a world without you in it, or for life without you in it. I had a two-year-old at the time, so I went into mom mode. I started planning for all of the things that she wouldn't have me for. What could I do now that would prepare her later? Or what could I tell my husband to make sure that she had everything she needed? In my head, I had made the plan to make all of this happen um, on day one, the day I was pretty much diagnosed. And in my head, I thought it would happen immediately, but treatment hits you a lot harder than you really think it's going to. And having it happen to me made it real, and I think it was kind of tumbling around in my head for months. But it wasn't until my chemo and radiation treatments came to a close where I could actually put the thoughts into actions, all I could think about was this. I remember when Tammy said she wanted a cause in her career in marketing. She didn't just want to just market anything. And she said, this is going to be my cause. And, and I think we were both specifically thinking to fight for younger women to be part of this early diagnosis. And I think we were just on the same page with that. She thought that I would think she was crazy for bringing this up, especially when she's actually going through the biopsy on the table, going through the biopsy and talking about that. But I never thought she was crazy, so. But if it is the second most common cancer in that age group, that's significant. And if it's happening to enough women in our community and, you know, they should be aware that it can happen at their age and that they shouldn't ignore a lump. You know, this task force actually, part of the recommendation is not to do self-breast exams. If Tammy hadn't done a self-breast exam, you know, I'd hate to think where she'd be. This, this campaign, this project, literally has been my coping mechanism. It's what got me through the hard times. It's what made me excited for this year, excited to put each step behind me. And my biggest hope is that we can make some waves and make someone realize that this new recommendation that women are not screened until 50 is insane. Today was beautiful because uh, I was able to actually take a step back and watch an idea that's been forming in my mind for so long actually come to fruition. Uh, I kind of got used to stepping out of my comfort zone and bearing scars uh, over the past year. And that's, it's over, almost empowered me to continue going. Uh, but today, I, I got to watch um, the birth of my idea within other women. They stepped forward and bared their scars along with me. It was, um, I don't know, it was just amazing to see, to see it all playing out exactly how it did in my head, even, even to the nth degree and even greater than I could have ever imagined. I would like more people to know what really happens when you have breast cancer and reconstructive surgery or mastectomy. Everyone is at risk. Check yourself, know what's normal for you, and if you think that something is wrong um, and someone tells you that you're too young, find someone else. So my name is Amy Coltharp and I'm 40 years old and I was diagnosed when I was 27. And it is very important to me that the world knows that cancer is becoming more and more um, common and we need to be ready. 
from that day when the doctor told me I was stage three breast cancer, I just thought that was the end of my life. I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through, other women have went through. It's just very, a very hard thing to deal with. It's I will be screened in X number of years. So if now the government's telling you you don't need a mammogram until you're 50, and you're standing there at 33, they're expecting you to wait 17 years. And here, if Tammy had waited that long, we never would have had her. So that is unacceptable. End of story. My hope is that by creating this campaign that's targeting young women that are affected just like me, um, we can bring awareness to the fact that it, it really can happen to everyone. Everyone that's been here today kind of represents that. And it's my goal that we will reach all of the people that you know, may end up in our shoes someday or maybe just know somebody that was in our shoes. We can make a real difference. I will start by saying that, as Molly stated, I am the crazy one who uh, decided to fight the government while I was fighting breast cancer. Um, I'm also the crazy one who invited a camera and the rest of the world in to see all of the pain, all of the fear, and all of the sickness that hides behind that beautiful, delicate pink ribbon. I. Um, might shock you in saying that two years ago um, I was literally the shyest and most, um, <laughs> I, I, I was the last person that would stand up and do any of this, really. And I was so self-conscious of my body that um, I didn't walk around in shorts, let alone a bathing suit. And if um, anyone here would have told me that I'd be doing this now, I would have probably said you were batshit crazy. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, like I said in the video, I did find a lump myself, but I didn't find it because I was doing a self-breast exam. Um, I did do self-breast exams, but I was actually having some really sharp pains in my chest um, to the point where I did see a cardiologist actually um, about six months before. And um, as the pains got worse, I would grab my chest. So. Um, one of the times that it was happening, I felt a lump. Um, I'll be honest, I found it, and although I freaked out right away and started going through all the scenarios in my head, I didn't even tell my husband for at least two weeks. Um, I did the research, I Google doctored, and realized that it was probably something a little more serious. So I did tell my husband, and um, even at that point, I don't think we called for at least another two weeks. So. Um, once I made the call, I saw my OB first. Uh, she did tell me that based on my age alone, they typically wouldn't have uh, done anything for six months. They would have watched it. But she had a family history herself, so she said she wasn't taking any chances. So uh, after that day, I got a call from Lemon Holton Cancer Pavilion, and they set up um, a day of mammograms, ultrasounds, and a biopsy to rule out cancer. After two mammograms, I was sent to have an ultrasound. Um, everyone I met that day uh, got teary-eyed in my presence, so I was starting to sense something, but I just talked myself into believing that they were having a bad day, maybe fighting with their boyfriend, something. Um, in the ultrasound, uh, the technician was super cheery, talking the whole time, and then I noticed she kind of got a little quiet, so I was sort of catching on. And then she said um, that she had to talk to the radiologist. So she tried desperately to make it seem like it was part of the process, but at this point I knew. Um, she just said that he wanted to look at the scans on his screen. She left me laying on the table for 20 minutes at least. 
Um, during that time, I had a lot of time to uh, go through all the scenarios in my head. Um, but something crazy happened, and I was no longer thinking all of the crazy and scary cancer thoughts. In fact, my mind um, just started racing with moments that seemed to make it seem like all of this was part of a bigger plan for me. Right away, um, I thought of losing my aunt um, when I was just 15 years old uh, to breast cancer. She wasn't a blood relative, but she was the closest relative I had, um, the one I looked up to and the one that I modeled myself after. Um, I thought of the fact that when she found her lump and went in, they told her that she was too young for breast cancer. Um, and by the time they gave her the time of day, it had already spread throughout and she passed away in two years. Um, I thought about the promise I made that I told no one about um, on the night she passed. I promised that if she couldn't be here to do all the good that she was doing and to be all the good that she was, then I would be and do the good for her. And I oddly promised that someday I would do something to fight for young women like her who were being diagnosed with breast cancer, yet um, society is telling us that we're not at risk. I thought about my friend Vicki, who I had met about five years before, maybe seven, um, and how on the night that I met her, I told her that she reminded me of my aunt. Just a year later, she too was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I thought about how our friendship grew when she um, decided that she wanted to campaign to try to get on the Ellen DeGeneres show to share her breast cancer story. I thought about a reoccurring dream. Actually, it was more of a reoccurring nightmare that I had about a year before. So I was up late editing one night and I listened to um, old shows while I was editing and I was watching Parenthood. One of the key um, members of the cast was being diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And it just took me back to when my aunt was diagnosed and I was overcome with emotion. Um, almost every night for the next couple months, I was waking up in the middle of the night sobbing. Um, I told my husband that I felt like it was going to be me who was in the hospital bed, that it was going to be me who was diagnosed with breast cancer, and that it was going to be me who was taken um, from her child. I remember him hugging me and saying, that's crazy. Um, you're young and you don't even have breast cancer in your family. You're not going to get breast cancer. And then something crazy happened. In the moments before my technician came back in the room, my life literally flashed before my eyes. I thought about my aunt, and I wondered if she had been trying to send me a message um, in the dreams and maybe prepare me for what was about to happen. I wondered if there was a bigger reason as to why I met Vicki and why she reminded me so much of my aunt. None of it um, really made sense, but everything made sense at the same time. My mind was racing, and uh, my heart was racing, really. I realized in that moment that none of it was a coincidence. Um, cancer was always going to be in the cards for me. My mind went silent in a very strange calmness came over my body as I prepared for what was about to smack me in the face. I remembered a quote that Vicki had told me a few years before. She said, life is not defined by what happens to you, but how you respond to it. In that moment, I vowed that I wasn't going to let cancer win. I vowed that I was going to make good on the promises that I made to my aunt. Um, and that I was going to do everything in my power to turn my negative into somebody else's positive. I decided while laying on the table that I was going to step outside of my comfort zone, which was pretty small. But I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew that I was going to do something. And I told my husband later that um, I was finally going to let go of some of my control freak tendencies and just let whatever was meant to happen, happen. And I was going to let this journey take me wherever I was meant to go. Minutes later, I was led into the radiologist's office. 
Uh, there were screens lining the back wall, all of different images. I remember the radiologist looking at me and um, telling me to sit down. And then he started pointing at things at the screen, um, danced around a little bit, and uh, almost gave me no information at all. And then he just looked at me and said, this is pretty serious. I think you have two forms of breast cancer. And then he kind of whisked away. <laughs> I had a biopsy to confirm what I already knew in my heart to be true. Uh, but my mind was no longer filling with fear. I had kind of accepted that I couldn't change what was happening. So I had my game face on. Um, my biopsy nurse, Jan, and my radiologist, Dr. Cruiser, who's also Tammy, were amazing. And honestly, the relationship that was formed over that um, biopsy table has now blossomed into a beautiful friendship. While I was there, we actually did joke around a little bit and uh, made small talk. And it was really the perfect distraction from the craziness that was happening in my family. Um, but there was a moment when I looked up at Dr. Cruiser and said, can you tell me what you're seeing? Uh, I remember her voice cracking as she looked down at me and said, I'm pretty certain it's cancer. Uh, I remember looking back up and saying, okay, and then saying, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to fight for younger women, and I'm going to fight for screening. I know she said that she didn't think I was crazy in the video. I totally think she thought I was crazy. <laughs> My world was crashing around me. And oddly, I didn't cry or even fall apart for months. Um, I think I knew that as a mom, I needed to keep it together, because if my family saw me falling apart, then they would too. I was told in a matter of a few days that I had cancer, that I would have to lose both of my breasts, that the treatments would cause me to lose my hair, and that I wouldn't be able to have the second child I so desperately wanted and we were trying for at the time. I was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma and DCIS. I had five pretty good sized tumors in my left breast and calcification throughout um, and some lymph node involvement. Over the past two years, I've spent more days in the hospital for surgeries and infusions than I have outside of the hospital. I've had 14 surgical procedures to date, including a bilateral mastectomy, an emergency egg harvest, an emergency surgery to remove an infected tissue expander, multiple reconstruction surgeries, three rounds of fat and tissue grafting, the preventative removal of my tubes and ovaries, and a chest tube placement to correct a spontaneous pneumothorax, which is a hole in your lung, and only I would have that happen. I was put into a medical-induced menopause um, at the age of 33, and I've had multiple infections requiring lengthy hospital stays. Six months of, and 18 rounds of chemotherapy, 28 rounds of radiation, and I will be on hormone therapy for the next 10 to 15 years which has already caused the early onset of osteoporosis. Uh, but in the midst of all this darkness, I did find a silver lining. I was finally able to make good on the promises that I had made to my aunt all those years ago. And I've become the person that I think I was always meant to be. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I knew on day one that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to do something. But I'll be honest, I had no clue what I was signing up for. <laughs> I uh, had reached out in the beginning days. I, I hadn't even thought it through. I hadn't talked to my husband. But I had reached out to my amazing photographer, who I didn't know at the time, and said that I had breast cancer and that I was wondering if she'd be willing to help me document and share my story. The second I hit send, I ran out of the room and told my husband <laughs> and panicked. Um, because I started to realize what I was setting into motion. Um, seconds later, I heard the ding on my computer, and she had already responded saying, oh my gosh, I would love to be a part of this. And she too had a breast cancer family history, I guess. Uh, I also um, started a Facebook page, but it wasn't to start sharing initially. It was because I couldn't keep up with the fact that people were texting and calling me constantly. And uh, I needed to have one place that everyone could go to get updates on me. Um, 
but I didn't think I'd be sharing photos. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know that I'd be doing any of this, honestly. I, I had the plan that I was going to do something and I had the plan to put a book together for my daughter um, with, with photos and blog posts for me. Um, I wanted her to know that her mommy was strong, um, that her mommy didn't give up and that even on my hardest days that she was always the reason why I got up and fought. Um, and I wanted my husband to be able to give that to her if breast cancer did take me in the same way that my aunt was taken from my cousins. So, it all changed when I sat down and started writing. From the first post, um, the words kind of just flowed to my fingertips. It was almost like somebody was writing through me. And I was, had never been a writer, and I still don't consider myself a writer. But um, it came easy. What was hard was hitting post. <laughs> um, and at that point, um, two weeks later, I think the local news caught wind of it and did a story. And then my page went viral. Right away, I started receiving messages from other women who were facing breast cancer. They were thanking me for being their voice and for putting all of the thoughts and feelings that they had into words when they couldn't do so. Um, I received messages from caregivers and even doctors and nurses thanking me for helping them to understand what we as patients actually go through on a personal level. And I was even told by um, women that were going through it at the time that I was, uh, the, my willingness to share and my candidness was what gave them what they needed each day to keep going through their hardest treatments. Each thankful message motivated me to step further outside of my comfort zone. And eventually I followed my gut and started the blog, My Personal Pink Tide, and stepped completely out of my comfort zone by actually sharing the photos and uh, very in-depth blog posts through uh, pretty real. Yes, uh, I was bluntly honest, <laughs> to be real. Before I knew it, um, my story was being shared on the homepage of the National Sozin G. Komen site, which I still think is crazy. Um, Spectrum Health featured me in their Lemon Holton Cancer Pavilion marketing campaign, which included a giant billboard on 131. And I was being asked to speak at local breast cancer events here in West Michigan. All of this made my anxiety level go through the roof. but. I have this feeling that I'm supposed to be doing this, so I've continued to say yes um, with each thing. I had pushed through all the anxiety, and I had finally opened up myself to be vulnerable in the public eye. I wasn't sharing everything, I'll be honest, but I was sharing far more than I thought that I would, and I was doing a lot of things that I never thought I could do. I talked about how hard it was to put 2015 and all my treatments behind me. And I talked about how the thought of dying is always in the back of my mind, even now, it never goes away. Um, I talked about the loneliness that you feel when you go through something like this and how hard it is to get back to the world of the living because you can no longer relate to anyone or to normal problems anymore. I talked about how how hard it was to witness um, someone that I got close to, uh, my chemo buddy. She had a recurrence, um, which is my biggest fear, and how quickly it took over her body and how quickly she was taken from her, pam her family and from me. And I was trying to work up enough courage to address some of the things that none of us, none of us want to talk, to, talk about, um, the things that are really uncomfortable, like the financial strain, um, the fact that it can completely ruin you from being in a, a really good stage of your life to not being able to pay the light bill or wondering if you're going to get groceries that week. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that cancer completely stripped um, any intimacy out of my marriage and we had been married for five years, and I still wonder if that'll ever get better. And I wanted to talk about the fact that cancer had been ripping my marriage apart from day one. 
um, when something so scary has the ability to bring two people really close, but it also has the ability to drive a wedge between you as well. I also talked about how 2016, to my surprise, was way harder than 2015. Um, because I had seven more surgeries and uh, recoveries, I had to make peace with the fact that I'm still spending three days in the hospital to receive infusions from a medical condition that chemo and all of the trauma to my body has made way worse. Um, I faced the emotional struggle um, that comes with picking up the pieces of your life after cancer. I worked with a community of supporters to bring my Forgotten Fighters campaign to, uh, to life. And for the first time since I started my blog and I set off on this crazy quest to break down barriers and change the perception that any cancer is a good cancer, I was paralyzed by the ill thoughts of someone close to me when it was brought to my attention that she didn't approve of my sharing. Um, that she didn't feel like this type of struggle or this weakness should be made public. And worst of all, that she questioned my motives for sharing altogether. It hit me like a ton of bricks <laughs> because anyone who knew me knew that this wasn't me. Um, I was being guided by something and I felt since day one like this was something that I was supposed to do. None of it was easy. Um, and none of it was anything that I was excited about. Like I said, there's an anxiety level that comes with everything, including this. And um, for seven months, I've been, I've been trying to address it. I knew in my heart that she was wrong, and I knew that I shouldn't listen to it. I knew that um, I wasn't doing it for her. I was doing it for all the women who were benefiting from what I was doing. But I, I couldn't get over that hump. I couldn't get over the fact that she didn't know me enough to know my motives. And I couldn't push through it. Most of all, I've been trying to process the worst disappointment that I could, I could ever feel. And that's the disappointment within myself. It kills me that because of the thoughts of one person, I have not been sharing all of the pain with the world. And I've not been responding to all of the women who have been reaching out to me. I've not been trying to make a difference by pushing my Forgotten Fighters campaign further. And I have not been bringing hope and inspiration to others walking this path. Truth is, I've written a post to address this a hundred times. And none of it felt right. And I just, I couldn't post it. So I realized over the last month that I wasn't supposed to because I'm supposed to be telling all of you. Felt like my world was crashing around me again. I had finally felt like I was making a difference and that everything that was horrible was turning into something good. And out of nowhere, this happened, and I questioned everything that I stood for and everything that I had become. I found it hard to be optimistic, which is crazy for me, um, in my own medical obstacles. And for the first time, I finally hit my breaking point and felt the anger that typically comes with a cancer diagnosis. And the worst thing of all was I started to resent the beautiful mission that I believe is my purpose. But that's until now. I have come to realize that I was meant to lose someone that I love to breast cancer at a young age because it taught me the value of my own life and it pushed me to be the best possible version of myself. I was meant to meet Vicki and witness her desire to share and inspire because she's now inspiring me to step outside of myself for a greater good. And I was meant to experience all of the pain and the fear and the sadness and the sickness <laughs> because in the end, I believe I'm meant to be doing everything that I'm doing right now. None of this has been easy, including facing all of you here today. But I've also come to realize that the person that doesn't approve of what I'm doing is right. Everything I'm doing is to get attention, but not in the way that she believes. I made myself an example as an attempt to get people to take their blinders off 
and to see the reality that more and more young women like myself are being diagnosed with breast cancer. Because really, it takes seeing a broken system firsthand to give humankind the desire to fix it. And most of all, I've realized that you kind of have to dance on the edge of too much if you really want to make change in this world. Because of all of you, I'm going to continue dancing. I would like to thank Creative Mornings for becoming my latest meant to be and for unintentionally pushing me to face what has been paralyzing me for seven months and for leading me back to what I'm so passionate about. I'm not done fighting for young, younger women and I'm not done fighting for this cause. Thank you.